All right, everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, like I said, if you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat and take a minute to fill out the check-in form. Um, we really would appreciate that. Um, so during the presentation, put all your comments and your questions in the chat. Um, our TA Marjorie will be monitoring it, and there will also be some time for questions at the end. Really quickly, just to go over some really easy things. So um, these are the Zoom participant controls. I'm sure that many of you are aware already, um, but you have your mute button in the bottom right corner. You'll probably notice that you were unable to unmute at this time, um, just because we wanna make sure that there's no background noise or anything while our guest speaker is um, lecturing. Um, you can turn on your video though. You can see that is right to the right of the mute button. And also plenty of you have already found the chat button. And again, we're just gonna ask that you remain muted while our guest lecturer is speaking. So before we really get into things, I just want to start with our course instructors. So Wendy, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wendy Avidad Rodriguez. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm a first year PhD student in the Community Health Sciences Department. Um, it's really nice to have all of you here, and I'm glad um, that you could make it today. And Marjorie. Hi, everyone. We're so glad to have you all here. My name is Marjorie. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a second year Master of Public Health student at UIC in the Community Health Sciences Division. Thank you. And I'm Zoe Harris. I use she, her pronouns. And I am also a first year um, PhD student in the Community Health Sciences program here in the School of Public Health. So just really quickly about the course. So this is an annual course that's free and open to the public. And the idea is to prepare public health leaders and community members with the tools to bring about social change and address structural determinants of health. All these course meetings will take place virtually via Zoom and it's open to students and the public from 5.30 to 6.30. And after that time, it's solely for the students who have registered for this course for credit. For people who are new to epidemics and to UIC, for some background, this class was created because of student leadership in radical public health, which is one of the student groups here, and it's now sponsored by the Collaboratory for Health Justice, where we're trying to bring about community voices to the forefront of in the School of Public Health. And you can find out more information about the Collaboratory on their website. So just really quickly, today's lecture and lectures in the future might contain material that's difficult to discuss and to hear. So we just remember to please step away if you need to take care of yourself during the presentation. Um, and especially if you're a student, if you're experiencing any range of issues um, that can cause a barrier to learning, as you can see, we're putting on the live transcript. Um, we will have more um, correct closed captioning in the recordings, um, but there's also the counseling center available um, and you can find more information on their website. We just want to really quickly do a land acknowledgement. So this is the one that we have for the Collaboratory for Health Justice, which acknowledges that UIC resides on the traditional territories of the three fires people, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Badawatomi, which was purchased after two and a half years of open warfare, decades of violent encroachment, and the defeat of a pan-Indian movement to keep settlers out of the Great Lakes regions at the Treaty of Chicago in 1821, receiving their final payment before moving westward in 1835, and the area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes. The state of Illinois is also currently home to more than 75,000 tribal members, and the Chicagoland area is currently home to one of the largest and most diverse urban Native communities in the United States. Illinois is also the territory of the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Anaka, Menominee, Sac, Fox, and their descendants. And we just want to recognize that the Indigenous people here are the traditional stewards of this land that we now occupy. And as we work, live, and play on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historical wrongs of colonization. And for those who are not residing in the Chicago area, we encourage you to look into the indigenous people of your own lands. And now Marjorie, would you like to introduce our speaker for this evening? Yes, thanks so much, Zoe. So I'm pleased to introduce the speaker for our first session, who's Dr. Linda Ray Murray. Dr. Linda Ray Murray has spent her career serving the medically underserved. She has worked in a variety of settings, including med medical director of the federally funded health center, Winfield Moody, which served Cabrini Green Public Housing Project in Chicago, residency director for occupational medicine at Meharry Medical College and bureau chief for the Chicago Department of Health under Mayor Harold Washington. Dr. Murray is the recently retired chief medical officer for the Cook County Department of Public Health. She also practiced as a general internist at Woodlawn Health Center, 
was an attending physician in the Division of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Cook County Hospital and is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health, Occupational and Environmental Health, and the Health Policy and Administration Departments. Dr. Murray plays a leadership role in many organizations, including the National Association of City and County Health Officers, Health Equity and Social Justice Team, the National Executive Board of American Public Health Association, and serves on the board of the Chicago-based Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. In 2011, Dr. Murray served as president of the American Public Health Association. She is the co-chair for the Urban Health Program Community Advisory Committee at UIC. Dr. Murray has been a voice for social justice and healthcare as a basic human right for over 40 years. She remains passionate about increasing the number of Black and Latino health professionals. I'll turn it over to Dr. Murray now for her presentation. Well, good evening, everyone. Let me get my slides up here. I'm glad that uh, all of you all could make it. I want to emphasize um, what was said a minute ago about the history of this course, uh, because what I really want to talk about today has to do with that history. Um, this is a student generated course. It took a lot of work for Radical Public Health, one of our student groups, to get the course established. Um, and the key thing to remember about this is that they were active in their own education. And just like I have here with Brother Malcolm, I, what I'm going to encourage you to do, not only for this course, but in general, for all of the uh, education that you're paying huge amounts of money for, uh, is to really try to take control of it yourself and understand that this is something that's worth investing your time and energy in. I don't have a specific topic. Um, if you, if you look at the sort of schedule for this course, my goal is really just to try to provide some basic framework, uh, not only for the rest of this course, you have great speakers and topics coming up, but hopefully to help you think about how to restructure uh, what you're trying to learn. I wanna do a special shout out to, uh, especially our, our uh, bolus of medical students that are joining this course. This is the first cohort of our four year joint MD and PH program. So welcome all of you. I'll be talking to you all uh, over time later. Um, so this quote is one of my favorite quotes by Malcolm X. And what he says saying is really true, which is if you think it really can be dangerous. And so um, I'm going to suggest to you that that's what you have to do. That's what you're paid for. We did a land acknowledgement. I sort of like the thing at the top to remember wherever you are, we live and work on, on stolen land. Um, so let's talk about what science is. And one of the things that really drives my blood pressure up, especially in the past couple of years, is that we misconstrue and misdirect what science is. So people have lots of notions about what science is. They think it's a set of uh, uh, just a set of knowledge or methodological uh, outreach. But really, in my opinion, science is a social institution, just like all the other institutions we have in society. And it's, it's subject to all the kinds of problems, racism and other things that those, uh, that those institutions are subject to. I think the role of science is to try and develop theories that explain and predict phenomenon and allow us to change the world that exists. So when we say things like, we're going to follow the science, think about what's that meant in the past two years. It doesn't mean shit. You know, there's not like, a, it's, it, science is not like a Bible that's out there. We're gonna follow the science. And so it's obvious what you should do in any given situation. Uh, it, if you really understand what science is about, you understand that whatever we think we understand today about science is wrong because that's the nature of science. It's gonna change in the future. And for public health, we have some special challenges. And so I'm gonna intersperse, by the way, you all will have access to a PDF of this, but I'm gonna intersperse some books throughout this talk, again, to try to give you extra stuff to do uh, that, that I think will be helpful in your careers. So this is Nancy Krieger, in my opinion, one of our, our uh, best uh, epidemiologists uh, in the country and the world. And, and she really argues for putting theory in our public health science. Uh, we say in public health often that biostatistics and epidemiology are the scientific foundations of our field. But in fact, uh, we don't really pay that much attention to the theoretical underpinnings of epidemiology. Nancy argues that that's a big mistake. This first book here on the left 
It's her basic uh, textbook where she goes through the history of our field. I don't have time to cover all of this. I will tell you the history of statistics and epidemiology is not an even linear uh, uh, movement. Uh, there are lots of racist, fundamentally racist notions in, about how we think about epidemiology. That's for another, another time. And then her latest book here, uh, The uh, Eco-Social Theory and Embodiment uh, just came out a couple of months ago. So again, I invite all of you to at least uh, try to read these books and um, that becomes important. The other thing that we don't do very much of is we don't really talk about what do we mean by health. Um, we have the WHO definition uh, from 1948 that says it's not simply the absence of disease, but there are lots of other definitions. This is a definition I like the best of people's health charter, um, and it makes it very clear. Health is a social, economic, and political issue, and most importantly, a, a human right. And so you can't really talk about health and you can't talk about public health without being political. I desperately urge you to ignore people who argue that public health is not political. They're smoking something. I don't know what's going on with those people. Everything's political, but especially public health is political. And if you don't understand that, we don't make much progress. So, Kamara Jones, Dr. Jones, and we'll talk about her a little bit more later, argues that these uh, values here on this slide are some of our basic problems in why we can't make progress in public health and in, the, in this country. These are not, I don't think, the only American values, but these are important values that we teach and we reinforce, and they hold us back. We tend to focus on the individual. Now, let me be clear from a historical point of view, there is something really liberating for human beings when we are able to consider not just the group, but also individual wishes and, and, and uh, skills, et cetera. Uh, but in the United States, we go overboard on this and we focus on the individual. That's why people can go around and say, I wanna individually not wear a mask, so why should I have to? Uh, we don't pay much attention to history. We pretend as though history is unimportant and that's one of my main themes tonight. We support a white supremacist ideology, whether people want to admit it or not. And if you don't know history, it's easy to pretend that you don't. Um, we have a myth of American exceptionalism. This is really amazing to me. We act as though there's something unusual about our country and exceptional about our country. Um, we have a myth of meritocracy. We have a myth of a zero sum game. So again, people have this notion that if someone else makes an advantage, if someone else makes progress, somehow it has to take away from them. And we don't think very much about the future. So I think that these American values are major problems. And what you need to ask yourself as a health worker is what are values, what do these values mean to you? And what values are you willing to support and fight for? Oh, I'm sorry, I went too fast on that slide. This is a climate change slide, it's just to, uh, to remind us that when we have a major problem like climate change, which I didn't see on our list of topics, um, you have to understand how it relates to everything else. So there's no question that what we're doing to the planet is a major problem for human health. And that has to think, enter in everything we do, whether we're talking about teenage pregnancy or smoking, we have to consider its relationship. And in public health, we're too sloppy about our language and what we say is important. I think this is because we're not willing to really talk about structure and we're not really to think about the theoretical frameworks that underlie this. So we see this all over. Uh, we see it at public health meetings. We have these maps. This happens to be a map for Chicago, but we have these sort of subway maps for all kinds of metropolitan areas. Uh, and this, this catchphrase which comes to us from Robert Wood Johnson, one of the many things I don't like about that foundation, your zip code matters more than your genetic code. So let me just stop for a moment and ask you, this is unfortunately Zoom, so I won't ask you to respond, and ask you what the hell is a zip code? A zip code, so, I, so I'm old, and I'm old enough to have lived before zip codes were invented. So that helps give you some historical perspective. So a zip code is just the route that the postal workers walk to deliver the mail. That's all it is. And why the hell should that have anything to do with anyone's health? 
except for the health of the postal worker that's getting some exercise. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. The reason why we can make this kind of ridiculous notion is because we live in a racist, segregated cities. That's what we're really saying. But we don't say racism and segregation matters more to your health than your genetic code. We don't say that. We have this little, you know, advertising slogan, your zip code matters more than your genetic code. When we do things like that, we undermine our field and we belittle the science that we ought to be following. Most of you know, and certainly those of you who are already, uh, you know, that, that have already started your public health formal training, know about these eco-social models about theories of causation for disease and health. Uh, so this happens to be the WHO model. I'm not gonna spend time on it and it should be familiar to you. I just wanna point out, which I think the collaboratory is very clear about, these social determinants of health here in the blue are intermediary factors. And so one of the things that happens over time is that certain catchphrases become popular. People talk about them and use them without necessarily understanding them. So they act as those social determinants of health explain all the differences that exist in healthcare and, and health of human beings that they don't. And they also act like these are sort of personal failings of individual people. Uh, what the collaboratory and what I think is and what the consensus of our field is, the most important thing that we need to be worried about are the structural determinants of health, uh, not just of health equities or disease, but actually of health. There are other models. Here's an earlier model from Nancy that she put out in 1994 which I like prefer to use in, when I talk to Americans um, because I think it helps make clearer what we're talking about. But the point I wanna make is that there are many different models of how we think health is determined. And one of your tasks as an expert in health and certainly someone who is being trained in public health is you ought to understand the arguments and the debates and the differences in these models. So I get upset if we only teach one model, okay? Um, and act as though that model has always existed and it explains everything. There are huge debates going on in the world today and have been for all of history, but certainly in my career around what explains human disease, what explains human health. Your task as a younger health professional is to understand those arguments and hopefully to make a contribution to those arguments. And you can't do that if we're not thinking about what these models mean, do we really believe them? What do we agree with? What do we not agree with? Who agrees and who doesn't agree? Here's a great series of other books. And I wanna point out uh, Jaime Braille's most recent book here, which summarizes in English for us non-Spanish speaking people, the Latin American social uh, medicine movement, which in my opinion, is the most advanced um, and sophisticated social medicine concepts that we have in the world today. They're very different than our American or than the WHO model. So this is a criticism of the WHO model. Um, and, it, and it means some very different things about how we do research, how we organize our work, how we think about what we're doing. Um, and there's other books in this series are also very enlightening. You can see the one on climate change there. So let's come back to just ordinary American stuff, which means racism. So Dr. Kamara Jones, uh, who hopefully most of you know and have heard of, argues and has a definition for racism, which I think makes sense. Uh, she says it's some, a system that unfairly advantages some people, unfairly disadvantages other people, uh, saps the strength of the whole society. Um, this definition, which I have no problem with, is a public health medical type definition. There are so many other disciplines that have all kinds of nuanced understanding and discussions about racism and what it means. Um, and we should pay attention to that in public health. We tend not to do that. The critical thing, of course, is to remember that anti-Black racism plays a special role in, in the world uh, and certainly in our society. Um, and that racism is not binary. It's not a Black white issue. Um, it, that's the dominant form that we talk about it in the United States, but really it's a white, not white issue is what it is. Uh, and it changes over time. It's, it's uh, tools and problems change over time. 
beyond just racism as an individual psychiatric disease. It may very well be that, but that's not the part that interests me. Uh, Kamara emphasizes it, and we talk about in public health what we mean by structural racism. And again, I want to remind you that there are many, many other disciplines, sociology, urban planning, uh, anthropology, psychology, that have all kinds of um, uh, notions and theories about structural racism and how it works. Uh, but that's what we need to be looking at. I fall into the category of people. It's not necessarily a majority, but I am firmly entrenched. Uh, I agree with the Dr. Du Bois, uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, when he talks about racial capitalism. I think that we are a nation. I don't think you can separate capitalism and racism. It's my personal opinion. If you agree or don't agree, that's something you should think about because there are people who act as though you can separate those two. There are people who don't think you can separate. How does that influence what kind of research you do? How does it influence what kind of interventions you do to improve people's health? Uh, but here's a quote from Black Reconstruction. And here's a more recent article for, by Dr. Pertl that came out uh, a couple of years ago about racial capitalism and helping to understand the impact of COVID. Um, so let me, again, another couple of books <clears throat> that will, uh, uh, I think, uh, be useful to you and useful to read. And you don't, you don't have to read these all while you're trying to get your MPH or while you're trying to work on your dissertation. Just keep these in the back of your mind. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected, I went back immediately and reread Black Reconstruction by Du Bois and Nell Painter's book, The History of White People. So let me ask you, just think about it. If you wanna understand white supremacy, how can you do that if, not know, if you don't know what white people are and where they came from, what's their history? Uh, Cause this is something we invented. But. So I think Nell Painter's book is a great place to start. And slavery by another name uh, just talks about some more American history and how in fact slavery didn't end. Again, I just, I just want to remind you of how insidious our notions about race and American myth, it clouds our judgment. Um, I hope this is no longer true, but for decades, uh, I would ask that question in red. Uh, I would ask people, where do most African Americans live? I would do this in all black audiences. I would do it in mixed audiences. I would do it in audiences of all PhDs. I would do it in audiences of, of all nurses. And for years, no one ever got the answer when I did it in the United States. They would say the South cities. In fact, most African-Americans, most people of African descent that live in the Americas, and if you even want to restrict it even more, who have a slave ancestry and history, most of them live outside of the United States of America, and most of them speak Spanish and Portuguese. So just that notion of how we think and what we think of when we say African-Americans. If you understand history, and if you, there's no reason why you should try to remember all this stuff, but only about four or 6% of all the people in the, involved in the transatlantic slave trade that were enslaved came to the United States, to British colonies. 90 something percent went to the rest of the hemisphere. And so think about what that means when we look at uh, racism that we're talking about today. Here's another two great books. I wanna especially recommend uh, uh, Roxanne's book here, Indigenous People's History of the United States, an important, short, brief, enlightening book uh, will help you get a better understanding of what's really going on. And Paul Ortiz's book is also a wonderful book. So again, um, these are things you can read when, you're, when you don't have to take an exam or something. Let me get this out of the way. So <clears throat> in public health, nursing, medicine, those fields that broadly speaking talk about health, we have a special role in terms of racism and scientific racism. It's really American physicians and American biologists and American anthropologists that really codified along with the British, but that codified and built up this notion of quote unquote scientific racism. And for many American physicians, they actually argued that blacks and whites were different species. We weren't even the same species. One of my more favorite uh, racists is uh, Dr. Samuel Cartwright. Um, he's somebody who argued that the consumption of oxygen for blacks and whites were different. Uh, that may seem an absurd notion today, except 
I will tell you that we still do pulmonary function tests as physicians that talk about how your lungs are functioning. We still have those racially biased and racially separated, and we still make distinctions based on race today from that. I also liked him because he discovered these two new diseases for Blacks, uh, draptomania, which is a disease that causes slaves to run away. That's probably my favorite one. And the rascality uh, disease, which causes you to sleep during the day. So, so he actually invented new diseases, which was not unusual. So when we say that we believe in science, when we say that we want to be evidence-based, this was science and evidence at the time. Um, the census of 1840, an important census, actually uh, looked at for the first time mental health in the American people. And it argued incorrectly, but nonetheless, it argued that the chances of being insane was significantly greater among Blacks who were not enslaved compared to Blacks who were enslaved. So therefore, you know, we should stay slaves because you don't want to cause insanity. So this was a very famous uh, uh, result of our scientific work, which allows me to talk a little bit about Brother James uh, McCoon Smith, um, who stands as the first uh, Black that we know of, the first African-American we know of, who actually is trained formally in European allopathic medicine. Now, he wasn't able to get trained as a physician in the United States because after all, we didn't allow that. So he had to go to Glasgow where he got all of his education, but he returned to New York City um, he's a founding member of our field. So he's a founding member of statistics in the United States. You can see there that he, he helped found the New York Statistics Institute. He was a major abolitionist leader uh, uh, calling for the abolition of slavery. In 1947, his name was put forward in the first round of people to belong to the New York Academy of Medicine. This is a prestigious group that still exists today. In 1947, they said, we're not even going to vote on you because you're Black, and so we're not even going to consider your application. In 2018, Dr. Georges Benjamin, uh, the executive director for the American Public Health Association, went to the New York Academy and accepted on Dr. McCune-Smith's behalf his membership in the New York Academy of Medicine, 171 years later. So the fight of ideas, this struggle between different theories is going on all of the time. So you have a, a scientifically based accepted notion that Blacks are inferior, Native Americans are inferior, uh, Mexicans are inferior, Asians are inferior, Chinese, Filipinos. You have all of this buried in Western science, um, but people fought against it. Um, and these are just two of the Black physicians that fought against it. And again, I want to, I put this in, I, I will say, because we have so many medical students joining us here, but it's an example. I'm going to use this tonight as an example for what are we fighting about and where, how far have we come? This is just a map of schools, medical schools around the Civil War that admitted Blacks. On the right-hand side are Black medical schools, medical schools that were formed after uh, the end of the Civil War uh, during Reconstruction. Uh, you see Howard there, you'll see Meharry there, which are the ones you'll remember, but you'll see lots of others that you don't know uh, that was set up uh, after the war ended. There were 14 Black medical schools set up during Reconstruction. Only 10 of them produced graduates. Only two of them existed past the 1920s. And American medicine was truly backwards. It was not based in science, not even Western science. It was an apprenticeship style training. Um, and the Flexner report uh, was published in 2010. This is an important report that uh, modernized and reformed the training of American physicians. Uh, the Flexner report made a couple of important uh, decisions. They decided, for example, that all the medical schools for women should be closed. Before that, there were several medical schools for women, uh, including the first uh, two black women who became physicians went to all women uh, medical schools. And they had a special chapter on Negro medical education where they said that black physicians, Negro physicians should be limited to our own race. We should never practice on white people. Uh, they, he, he also suggested that Negro doctors be sanitarians. And he called for the closing. By, by 1910, there were only seven uh, historically Black uh, medical schools in existence still. 
he suggested closing five of them. And you won't be surprised when I tell you the two he said should stay open, Howard and Meharry. Um, and this was quote straight from his report. The upbuilding of Howard and Meharry profit the nation more than inadequate maintenance of a larger number of schools, like seven would have been too many. They are, of course, unequal to the need and opportunity. So in 1910, we have the Flexner Report funded by Carnegie Foundation under the auspices of the American Medical Association, which was a progressive force in 1910 trying to upgrade American medicine saying very clearly that we're going to create a situation, we're going to close these five schools, we're going to keep Howard and Meharry open, even though we know they're not going to be able to produce enough Negro physicians to take care of Black people in the United States. And this is what happened by 1923, 40% of the total number of medical schools that existed were closed, uh, but 71% of the Black medical schools were closed. So this just is a graph of where we are. The black, the top line here is the black population. But you can see in 2018, while we were about 12% of the population, black physicians were only five, barely not even 6% of the uh, physicians. This slide makes me, I won't say depressed, it makes me enraged. So in 2014, which is the year I retired from Cook County Health, 515 black men entered medical school all over the country, everybody. In 1978, which is the year I finished my internship, there were 542. So fewer black men were starting medical school at the end of my career than at the beginning. Put another way with the, with the nominators this time. In 1978, that's the year I became a fully licensed physician. Black men composed, comprised 3.1% of all medical students. In 2019, which is the year I, I stopped my clinical practice, 40 years of clinical practice, I stopped it in 2019 after turning 70, Black men were only 2.5% of all medical students. So what happened in those 40 years? Not enough. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on these books. If you're interested in uh, Black health in the United States, Here's some great books to look at. I want to point out from TB to AIDS. This is probably the best single book. There are lots of great books that looks at public health issues uh, among African Americans. And if you want to ask yourself, what's the history of Public Health Week? Read this book and you'll find out some of the history of Public Health Week. <clears throat> so What's going on? We, ha we have a lot of uh, uh, publicity and, and visibility right now. People that never heard of public health heard of it all of a sudden because we have a worldwide epidemic. So here are some of the problems. Why is the Atlantic Magazine reporting the best data that stopped now around COVID? How, how is that possible? But in fact, that's accurate that the Atlantic Magazine pieced together uh, without an actual like, formal epidemiologist the best data, racial data on COVID uh, death rates and, and case rates, et cetera. Why? Um, and here's a sister, Abigail Echo Hawk, that argues one of the reasons why. The Native American community is clear on this. Asian American community is clear. Data genocide. If you don't count people, then it's like they cease to exist. And uh, Abigail and her colleagues have pointed out that this inability to count people, the inability to include in data everybody is a major problem. It is, is fundamentally structural racism. Um, it continues an attitude of colonial research and colonial science. Um, and so this is a real problem for Native American communities. And even when we lump all Native Americans together, that's a little uh, disturbing. But it also happens when you talk about Asian Americans, because again, we take hundreds of different groups and lump them together or quote unquote Latinx, you know, what does that mean in English? Is what's going on with Puerto Ricans in the island the same as what's going on with Cubans in Miami? No. So we have to really stop having this attitude about data that is a Western white supremacist centric attitude. And a number of our colleagues in public health are talking about research and data justice. This is not the same is community-based research, okay? It's not the same. It's not the same as community engagement. These are all efforts that go in 
a direction that sounds right, but this is not the same as dust, uh, data justice. So if you have a framework that says communities deserve to understand what's going on, they deserve to, to frame the questions, that is after all the most important part of the scientific process. What questions are we trying to answer? Uh, do we have researchers that represent the communities writ large? Do we value the different skill sets that are necessary to do good research on human beings and how we organize ourselves? Too often we don't. We care about degrees and other nonsense. And um, So again, this is one group that is fighting for data justice. This is something we should be in the forefront of as um, public health people. And if we're not about doing that, we're not really about doing good science. So we have to have the right to ask the questions. The right to do research means the right to ask the questions, the right to be at the table when we talk about how we're gonna do something, the right to be able to vote on whether we spend money on this or that, the right to know what's going on. So when we had COVID, we didn't have that right. Most states in this country, in the country did not report data. They didn't stratify it by race. They don't stratify it by class. Um, so these are real problems if we talk about a scientific approach. Here's an article that I think is interesting. And, and again, it's, it's a question of what questions do you ask? This is from, uh, you see the reference down there, you can look it up. But this is saying, what would have happened if the death rates and the age at which people died for Black Americans have been the same as for whites. And I think I can't remember the exact number, but it comes up to, uh, you know, millions of people would have been in this, in this century that's listed here would have uh, lived longer. Uh, so, you, so it's a different way of thinking about the loss that we saw when you don't have this kind of equity. Or look at this problem. Here's maternal uh, mortality. Uh, we are an outlier, as this graph shows, in, in among rich countries, we're an outlier in so many ways among rich countries in so many areas. But this happens to be maternal mortality. This is one thing that has gotten worse in my career as a physician. So when I was in medical school decades ago, maternal mortality was whatever it was. And since then, it's gotten worse. Stroke has gone down people with high blood pressure has gone down, people who die from HIV has gone down, but maternal mortality has gone up, very different than the rest of the world. Um, when, we, when you look at the numbers, we often don't report them the right way. So here's a trend line that lumps everybody together. Here's some other things where CDC can do this if they want to, where they try to stratify a little bit. Here's black, white, and other, another horrible way to think about people as other. Here's a thing where they at least had a number, an estimate for Native American women. Uh, but look at this. And this is the kind of thing, if you're thinking, you'll ask that question. So this is just looking at maternal mortality from 2005 to 2009 to 2015, 2019. You can see black, white, uh, uh, Hispanic, Latinx. And every group has gone up. Every group has gone up in that time period. So we are getting worse, but look, <clears throat> the group that went up the most were white women, 55%. Blacks went up and blacks are still higher than anyone else well, in this graph, but <clears throat> only 22%. Those are the kind of questions we don't ask clearly enough <clears throat> because when we want to address maternal mortality, believe me, if white women knew that they were getting worse fast, we might have a different kind of set of resources that went to that. Um, this connection of women's reproductive health is an ancient old connection in this country. And it's overlaid with lots of history and racism. So we have the whole American eugenics movement <clears throat> that was the mainstay. It was the standard. It was the normal paradigm that we could improve human beings by breeding. That's exactly what it meant based on scientific racism. Um, so this, this was a, a movement that spanned uh, decades. It really didn't stop till the Nazis were defeated. Uh, but again, in this 60 some year period, there is, this is a low estimate that 64,000 Americans were sterilized based on eugenics. Um, 
the Mississippi appendectomy was a common procedure. When I was a little girl, I knew what a Mississippi appendectomy was. That's where you got your tubes tied or your uterus taken out. <clears throat> and this permeated American life. We are fighting about the, the Voting Rights Act now uh, in Congress. And so I thought it appropriate to put up Fannie Lou Hamer here. Hopefully some of you have heard of her. She led the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, really fought at the Democratic National Convention to have the, the integrated delegation from Mississippi seated instead of the all white Mississippi delegation seated, of course, we lost that battle. But in any case, Fannie Lou Hamer had a Mississippi appendectomy done on herself. And what happened here, usually people had surgery for usually some unrelated reason and were sterilized uh, without anyone asking their permission. That's what a Mississippi appendectomy is. Um, and so she's, she's one of the people who talked about that and the rage that caused her as a human being. Uh, I also, again, I'm pushing books here. Here's a recent uh, book that came out last year, um, a, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. California sterilized more women for eugenics than any other state and most of them the product were uh, Chicana women, Latin American women. And of course, wherever you have this kind of oppression, you have people who fight back. So here's Dr. Uh, Redberg Yuri, uh, Cherokee Choctaw physician who really exposed the kinds of uh, sterilization that were going on among Native Americans in the 1970s. This is not like in the 1920s. These are the 1970s where in one survey she did, 40% of Native American were, had been sterilized and 10% of men. Um, and then of course, Helen Rodriguez Tria is a great pediatrician, Puerto Rican pediatrician. Uh, just to remind you that about one third of Puerto Rican women on the island were sterilized uh, between the 1930s and 1970s. This is the place where the birth control pill uh, was tried out and clinical trials took place. Um, so Helen, Dr. Rodriguez Tria is, is a major uh, warrior for reproductive rights. And of course, we have our most recent example in 2020, where Dawn Wooten here, I don't have a real picture of her. She's a licensed practical nurse and LPN, African-American, spoke up because women were being taken from ICE detention centers for, again, for any number of reasons, but without permission, no discussion, uh, being sterilized uh, by physicians. So these things go on today and they're connected with the past. I'm not gonna read every single one of these, but I just wanna remind you that whatever we see, whether it's a January 6th event or whether it's a, a, a modern lynching, these things have gone on for generations. This is the Orangeburg massacre in 68, usually forgotten about though we talk about Kent State. This 1937 Memorial Day massacre took place in Chicago. Um, they, uh, the police department killed people during this demonstration. It was a called the Little Steel Strike. These were uh, predominantly white uh, steel workers on strike uh, killed in the streets. Uh, you can see this uh, uh, massacre in Ponce in, in uh, Puerto Rico. So this, this is part of our history and our tradition. The Tulsa massacre, I wanna take a minute and talk about that for one second. Um, because again, if you don't understand the history and the structural roots of what happened, you get in trouble. But these are other things. Uh, the 1919 uh, uh, riot uh, in Chicago, there's an excellent report on that. I invite you to read it um, and you can see these other massacres. But let me talk about Tulsa for one minute. Tulsa, you remember perhaps from the news because we just celebrated or memorialized the 100th anniversary of this, was considered the quote, Black Wall Street. But do you know why it was called the Black Wall Street? I mean, I didn't automatically know why, but I was wondering like, why would they call Tulsa the Black Wall Street? What was going on in Tulsa? I mean, why not New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago or Atlanta? Why Tulsa? Here's why. Tulsa in Oklahoma was, is, a, is a state where many, many uh, American Indians were moved from the southeast part of the United States, westward to Oklahoma, and uh, in, in what we call the Trail of Tears. And in those nations, there, had, there were many Blacks, some of them, some of the elites of those nations actually owned slaves. 
Uh, and some of them had incorporated blacks in their population. But in any case, they moved to Oklahoma. After the Civil War, you remember the promise that we never got like 40 acres and a mule, right? Remember that? Well, the white Confederates didn't have to honor that and they didn't. But the Native American nations had to honor it. The, you, the army, the Union Army went and said, okay, you have to free your slaves and you have to give them land. And that's what happened. And in Oklahoma, again, just to move a decade or two, a lot of that land had oil on it. So in 1921, when you had quote unquote Black Wall Street there in Tulsa, that's a result of that advance, the ending of slavery and the minor reparations for slavery in terms of land. So you had huge numbers, a high percentage of Blacks with land and some wealth and that attracted newly emancipated slaves from further east. And that's why you had a Black Wall Street. And that's one of the reasons why it was burned down. Um, so you can go back, whether it's Wounded Knee in 1890 um, or whatever, all of these massacres, I, it's sort of depressing. Um, so remember, what you think of as history is only part of what is real history. And we have to spend time to learn about each other's history and to uncover things that are buried. I think I'm gonna bring a book here. So at the same time period where blacks were being lynched in the South after reconstruction, as the Union troops were withdrew and as white supremacy was reasserted in the South, it never really went away. In that same time period, Mexicans were being lynched throughout the Southwest in the same numbers, in the same proportion as African-Americans were being lynched in the Confederate South. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised with that kind of history that we have what the horrible situations we have in uh, ICE detention camps today, even though most of those people are not Mexicans. And I wanna remind you that in the war that captured the northern half of Mexico in that treaty, all Mexicans were given automatic American citizenship immediately, not that that was honored. So here's some other books. This is a book about the lynching and mob violence against Mexican and Mexican Americans. Here's a, a great book on the history of Asians. This is one of the older books, but uh, Brother Takaki, I think is a great uh, scholar. He's no longer with us. Uh, so I, that's a classic. Um, and this book is more recent that talks about the Southern route to freedom. So again, we have the Northern routes. So we have the Harriet Tubman story where she lived in Maryland. She only had to go a couple hundred, a mile, a hundred miles or so to get North of the Mason Dixon line. But in fact, many, many slaves went South. They went to Mexico, to the Caribbean, other places uh, to escape slavery. The models that we talk about, the eco-social models that we like to talk about are only some of the models. This is, happens to be from uh, one of our attorneys, Daniel Dawes, uh, that talks about political determinants of, dead, of, uh, of health and how history is never dead. So each one of these little uh, problems and issues have historical antecedents. So if we talk about the Minority Health Improvement Act, uh, don't talk about that without understanding the Freedmen's Bureaus Act. So this is just some examples that he brings up. Um, if you understand that the structural problems with racism are not just the whole of maps and mortgages, this looks at the uh, New Deal, uh, which, where uh, agriculture and domestic workers were excluded under the Social Security Act. Most Blacks were agricultural and domestic workers. And that allowed a lower wage, um, uh, if you were a black Southerner. Um, so this is an example in Delaware, there was a Northern state, but the uh, fertilizer industry was 90% black. So they got it, they got that excuse not to raise wages there to allow that particular industry to have lower wages. Why? Because it, so many black people were in it. So this is sort of uh, Daniel Dawes's model. Again, it depends on what issues you're looking for. We have to be more, uh, uh, 
familiar with these political issues and other ways of considering it. If you look at what's going on today in the country, uh, what's going on with trying to get the Voting Rights Act reauthorized, then understanding this kind of stuff becomes important, what, what his model is on political determinants. And if we think about the data that we use in a different way, so here's uh, Sandra uh, Galea talking about what factors cause what deaths, okay? So, and I, I just put on the right some of the, in that 2018, the number of deaths caused by various diseases. So he's, he's, and these are very conservative estimates. I asked you to look it up. He's saying that low education causes 245,000 deaths in the year 2000. So this happens every year. Racial segregation, 176. So you can see there. Um, and there aren't that many diseases that have the same kind of level that this has. And you clearly could make this a longer list. So individual level poverty, income inequality, area level poverty, these also add up deaths. And so why don't we talk about it that way as public health people? Why aren't we trying to address that? And you can't talk about structural determinants of health without talking about power and oppression. That's not in the WHO model. I have a real problem with that, but we have to have it there because people don't just die because they're undisciplined and don't eat right and don't exercise and smoke. They die because of oppression and because they don't have power. And until we're willing to talk about that and think about how to change that, we're in big trouble. Let me come back to a local example um, here as we come to a close. Um, this I wanna raise up uh, Sister Hazel Johnson. We lost her a few years ago. Um, she was a community activist. She lived uh, for years in Altgale Gardens in the far Southeast side of our city. She was, by coincidence, uh, an early mentor to Barack Obama. Um, she really fought the Chicago waste industry for decades. Uh, she had seven kids. She's one of the mothers of the environmental justice movement nationally. Uh, it's been 30 years uh, that uh, since the uh, People of Color Conference happened for environmental justice 30 years ago last year. And she was really one of the organizers of that and one of our major speakers at that conference. Um, and she lived here at Artgale Gardens, which was built in 1945 as a landfill for Black veterans, okay? It was built for Black people and Black veterans. It's a landfill. I don't know if you all have ever been there. If you're not from Chicago, you should take a ride out there. Artgale Gardens had the highest concentration of hazardous waste sites in the nation. This is a public housing project here. It's surrounded by 50 landfills, 382 industrial facilities, 250 that we know of leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, this is a horrible industrial wasteland. Uh, in spite of what Daniel Burnham thought in 1909, he, his position was this could have been wonderful, beautiful parks, but that's not what we did. We built industrial stuff here. And this is the general iron situation, which is, uh, you can see here on the left, the general iron site. Um, on the North Branch of the Chicago River uh, in 2018. It's a recycling site in the middle of uh, the Gold Coast kind of rich neighborhood, Lincoln Park. And you can see on the right, the place that is being proposed that it be moved to on the uh, Calumet River. Um, and I, I am glad to say that I'm one of our many faculty uh, and students who signed this letter uh, in addition to our Dean, uh, Dean Giles, uh, calling on the mayor and uh, Dr. Alawadi not to grant a permit that would allow this recycling plant to be moved from a middle-class privileged neighborhood to a poor working class black and Latino community, which is already heavily burdened um, with uh, environmental pollution. Uh, the city of Chicago has a strong network of of community groups, Black and Latino predominantly, uh, that have worked on environmental justice issues. The general iron permit is only the latest of many. So our city is in the middle of the country. We have all the problems that exist in the country here, right here. Um, and whether we talk about essential workers that are working in the Chicago area or historical problems like we see here, we have to be able as public health workers and leaders to understand these issues. This is a demonstration, and don't be surprised, don't think that 
the demonstrations that we've had with George Floyd or the demonstrations we had with Dr. King are the first and only demonstrations that existed. That's just not a good reading of history. France Fanon is a psychiatrist, Caribbean born, um, who uh, was one of the movement psychiatrists who said, when we revolt, it's not for a particular culture. We revolt simply because for many reasons, we can no longer breathe. Um, so uh, in, I can't see the year that's here, hopefully you can see it. Um, this is a, a march that took place in New York City after whites went through East St. Louis, which was black then as it is now, and just killed a bunch of black people. Um, and so in response to this, this is, depending on who you believe, 8,000 to 15,000 blacks that marched. These are the women and girls marching first in white. This was a silent march. And this, this year is important, but for some reason I can't see it. You, hopefully you can see it. <clears throat> it was at a time when black people thought twice about marching for anything, but this was such a horrendous massacre that this march took place in silence on the streets of New York. Here's the black, the men's march, they wore black on that particular day and they marched silently. And overspread on this are all of the different legislative acts that we've tried to put in place to address the problem of not having full citizenship for most people in this country. And whether you start with the 13th Amendment, uh, the Civil War Amendments, and you can see the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the 14th Amendment, I'm trying to find the voting right, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1870. These are all acts and probably half of them couldn't pass today. Um, just like we're having, we can't get the Voting Rights Act passed today. There is a long history of fighting white supremacy in this country, not only from Black people, from Native American people, from uh, Mexican American people, it's from Asians, it's a long history. Um, but we have not always won. The battle is always, it's never linear. It's a, it's a long process. We are health workers. The fact that we've been unable to pass single payer health care, which is a mild minor reform, even in the midst of this pandemic, we can't get it passed, is a major problem. I can tell you this, that not only Hazel, but many of us sent Obama to Washington before he was president. He supported single payer. He just reneged on it. Um, this is a major problem. We're the only industrialized country in the world that haven't accepted the notion that medical care is a basic human right, and we fail to provide it. And even what little bit we provide, we restrict based on your legal status, which is really, we should be ashamed of. And I want to end with this pandemic response. Um, you have an opportunity here to observe in real time what's going on with the pandemic. And you should take advantage of that opportunity. You should read the debates and the arguments that people have. Um, and uh, we just had a major setback. Uh, I know uh, I was one of the signers of the amicus brief on these Supreme Court decisions, but the Supreme Court just decided today, they announced their decision today, they have blocked the OSHA rule. And I will say as an occupational physician, this is really distressful to me. This is a, <clears throat> the rule that OSHA put out that large companies over 100 employees could, had to mandate vaccines or weekly testing for their workers. Uh, so that was uh, torn down by the Supreme Court. They did uphold the CMS rule. This is a rule that said health workers had to be, the mandates were okay for healthcare workers if they accepted Medicare and Medicaid payment, which every health organization does. Um, and so I, I want to give this as an example because when you talk about what our response is, be aware that we do not have a national public health system in the United States of America. And I invite you to look at this book. We don't, it's unconstitutional. The constitution says health is a state's power. The states get to decide what they can do with health. That's the tradition of our legal system. So think about that as a structural barrier to how we uh, address and respond to a national uh, worldwide pandemic. So what do we need to do? Uh, this year is the 150th anniversary of the American Public Health Association. 
If you're not a member, you ought to join. I, hopefully you'll, you'll join us either virtually in person, depending on what's going on with the pandemic in Boston this fall. But as public health workers, we need a better understanding of history. We need a better ability to understand and analyze structural determinants. You can't do that if you don't understand the economy. You can't do that if you don't know what the employment rates are. You can't do that if you don't understand how the country works, what the electoral college does. These are structural determinants that we have to be clear about. We need the ability to communicate with a wide array of disciplines. We should have as much respect for, um, for our colleagues in anthropology uh, and ethnographic studies as we do for our statistical friends, actually probably more. And we have to have the, develop, uh, the ability to communicate with the general public, which is always a challenge and we falter on it. Um, I wanna do a shout out to CTU, but um, so what should we be doing? Just like the teachers union, we need to learn and teach history. We have to remember that racism is not binary. We have to oppose especially anti-Black racism. Learn to express <clears throat> the values that you wanna hold up. That should be your guiding point. What do you believe in? What do you think we should be doing as human beings? Start wherever you are. If you're a student, start there. If you're a young faculty member, start there. Start wherever you are understand the system that you're in and how it works because if you don't understand that you have no idea how to <clears throat> dismantle it and whatever you're passionate about whatever it is understand how that issue connects with other issues and most important don't let these folks psych you out understand that it is possible to have a different world <clears throat> and if we fight together we can actually create a world at peace where social justice, in fact, is the law of the land. So I don't know where we are on time. I think I went a little over, but uh, I, I'm certainly willing to take a few questions before we disband. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the hand raise function. Um, so if you have a question for Dr. Murray, then please raise your hand. Unfortunately, because of time, we don't, um, we can't take a lot of questions, but we will definitely do our best. And Dr. Murray, thank you so much. Great presentation as always. So like in 10 years, hopefully you'll have read at least two or three of those books that I mentioned. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes, I go. I will unmute you. Hi, Dr. Murray. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was incredibly powerful. Um, real quick question. Do you have any books or any resources to read about white uh, abolitionists or people in medicine who have been, you know, fighting against racism um, and fighting against these structures? Th those books exist. Um, and I don't have a lot of them off the top of my head. I'll tell you one that I think is very interesting. <clears throat> That's not just all white people. It's white and, and other people of color. Uh, <clears throat> the Good Doctors, I forget to think of the author of that, which is, which is a book about the history of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which is one of our groups uh, with white leadership, white doctor leadership, uh, that came up as part of the civil rights movement. And Dittmer. B-I-T-T-M-E-R, I think it's the author of that particular book. But if you email me later on, I can, I can find some other books. Please go ahead. Dr. Murray. Yes. I cannot breathe. And that is a compliment. Um, your overview of history and how it amalgamates into the healthcare system that we currently are trying to, I'm going to say unravel because that's one of my goals in mitigating health disparities. Um, it's just breathtaking. And I, I'm sitting here, um, I, I, I mean what I say, I can't breathe right now, but it's, it's a good I can't breathe because there is so much to take in. So I, I just wanna say thank you 
um, because I know a lot of this history that you just shared with us for many, many, many people on this call is very, very new to them. But I'm hoping that as we learn together that we begin to understand how we need to change and the urgency for that change. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. And let, let me just, um, let me just say, I don't want anybody to be intimidated by this stuff because I'm not a historian. You know, I'm a, I'm a physician and, uh, and, and my undergraduate major was math. You don't, all you have to do is ask the questions. And when you ask the questions, you'll slowly read and you'll slowly get more information and you'll talk to people. So don't act like you have to, this is not like, oh, you go and you learn everything and then you go, no, it's a process of what you're doing. So always ask, why is this like this? What's going on that this is, this is happening? Why can't my patient get a manogram or why can't, if you ask the questions, then you'll figure out <clears throat> with your colleagues uh, and, and the community, some answers. That's the key thing. All right, we only have time for one more question. So um, I have one that was sent in the chat, which I think is a good one. Um, but Dr. Murray, how can we talk about these topics with school age children? So I, I think that, um, I, I, I don't know whether you're speaking as a parent or whether you're speaking as a teacher, but I will say this. I think, I think don't underestimate what kids hear and think about, period. So, Times are different and you may have to more explicitly th say things today than maybe when I was a little, but when I was a little girl, you know, you could see what was going on. You know, if you lived in the South, you could see colored water, water fountains and white water fountains. If you lived in, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, you can see how people, are, black people are treated. I think you can still see those things today. The key then, of course, is to answer people's questions, to answer the kids' questions. Why are they treating me like that? Why do they ask that? Um, and, and don't be afraid of that. The kids know things are messed up. Uh, one of my friends was telling me recently, her, her son was like almost getting ready to be a preteen. And uh, out of the clear blue that sky one day, he said, mama, are you gonna tell me when I stop being cute? So he had already figured out that at some point, you know, it's one thing to have a six-year-old little black boy and be cute. It's another thing when you get to be 12 or 13 and you start growing, then all of a sudden you're a threat. So <clears throat> you just, we just have to try to speak the, our truth that we, as we understand it to our kids and let them see, because they're watching what we do, what, what we read, what we think, what we talk about. That's their first clue on what's going on. So what do you talk about with the adults around you? because your kids are hearing all of that. Thank you so, so much. I hope you all have fun in this course. Take, you know, it's, it's a, there's not a lot of heavy reading. I think you get one reading per, per lecture in this course. So I invite you to participate, uh, ask questions, cause trouble, and you shouldn't have to come just to this course to learn this stuff. This stuff should be part and parcel of every course that you do. Uh, and that's what we have to fight for. So fight just like your people ahead of you, your students ahead of you fought for this course. Think about what other courses and how other courses are needed. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is when I was here many decades ago getting my MPH, we had a mandatory course. It wasn't very good, but still it was a mandatory course in the history of public health. Where is that today? So cause as much trouble as you can. All right, I think that we are at time for this evening. Again, Dr. Murray, thank you so much. Um, for all of our participants, if you enjoyed the session, as always, please consider donating to the collaboratory um, so we can continue to put on these great sessions. We hope to see you in the future.